in just one minute for you. And the last one. Hello. Good afternoon. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kate Ambrose. I'm the president and executive director of the Association for Private Capital Investment in Latin America. We are an organization representing 195 global investment firms actively investing here in Latin America across everything from infrastructure and energy to technology and startups. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this panel. Apologies to all of you for um, having to wait so long for lunch, so we're going to keep it very punchy and, and move it right along. And we have an outstanding panel here to talk about building new financial ties and investing in growth with representation from government, uh, private sector, multilateral, and, and uh, Dubai, of course, as well. Uh, so to kick off the discussion, we are honored to have with us today uh, Minister of the Economy, Jose Ramon Valente of Chile. Um, Chile, as you may know, has been one of the great success stories of the Latin American region. And of course, we have the commonality here between Panama, Dubai, and Chile, that they're all places, uh, countries that have extraordinarily open economies very dynamic trade, great logistics, and, um, and, and high growth. So with that, I'm going to throw the first question to Minister Valente. Uh, Minister Valente, this is the second administration now of President Piñera that, that began last year. And of course, in his first administration, he had many important successes, perhaps best known, one of them being the Startup Chile program. So what is on deck for this administration? What are the key initiatives that you are working on from the Ministry of the Economy in this 
in this administration, and maybe once you talk about that, you can touch on some of the global trade relationships as well. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, very glad to be here. And um, of course, di going directly to, to your question, um, we have a very clear mandate from the president and, uh, and from the, the citizens of, uh, of Chile, which is to grow the economy. Uh, as you know, many of you probably know, Chile has uh, a very good track record of 30 years of uh, uh, very good uh, growth of about a 5% average a year during that period. However, between uh, 2014 and 17, we, ha we average only 1.5%. So this new administration that basically took uh, possession of the government uh, in, in March 2018 uh, had a very clear objective of uh, returning to a growth path compatible with uh, m basically making Chile a developed uh, economy in, in a relatively short period of time. The pres President Piñera talks uh, about uh, the end of the next uh, decade for that. Uh, so our goals are very straightforward in that uh, direction. We need to grow investment uh, to at, at the rate of 6 to 7% per year. We need to grow uh, productivity at the rate of uh, at least 1% per year. And with that, uh, we will be able eventually to achieve a 4% uh, growth for the economy. And with that, and a population that is growing at around uh, one, a little bit more than 1% per year, we will achieve uh, $37,000 uh, per capita income at the end of next uh, decade. So those are the goals. Now, of course, we, you need your, your toolbox uh, to achieve those goals, and when we uh, came into the government, we realized we didn't have all the tools that we needed for that. So we've been uh, working in creating the incentives, the institutions, uh, and, and the structure of the, and changing a little bit the structure of the economy to achieve those goals. So in short, what we've been doing is first uh, in the ministry that uh, I'm in charge of, which is the Minister, the Minister, uh, the Ministry of Economy, we've been uh, um, producing what we call a microeconomic revolution, uh, which basically means uh, uh, reducing the time that is uh, needed uh, for investment uh, to be done in the country and increasing certainty, that's on one side, and in the size of productivity, basically cutting red tape, improving the regulation, and uh, uh, most uh, importantly, uh, probably for this panel, is that uh, we're trying to harmonize our regulation with the best practices around the world. That will make businesses uh, cross-country uh, easy, easy to, to work with, and also will make trade and investment <coughs> easy to deal with uh, in, in our country. Um, so that, that's the objective. Last year we, we achieved 4% growth, so we really uh, uh, had a, a wonderful year with 1% growth, 5% growth in, uh, in investment, and 1.5% uh, growth in productivity. Uh, now the challenge is to keep that, uh, not just uh, for this year, but for many years to come. So the objective really is to improve and to increase the uh, growth potential uh, of the economy. And for that, of course, we need these structural reforms that we're working in, in, in investment, productivity, and also tax reform that's being discussed right now in, in the country to incentivate uh, entrepreneurship, uh, SMEs, and, and investment. Great. If you can just touch very quickly on trade relations and, for example, uh, the Middle East or other parts of the world where you're looking to build new relationships. Well, Chile, as you said it uh, in the introduction, is one of the m most open economies in terms of trade and investment uh, around the world. We have 64 uh, trade agreements that, uh, uh, with that, uh, we cover 90% of the GDP <coughs> of the world. Uh, we're, in that sense, a very open economy, uh, and uh, we, we have done that uh, in many cases uh, with uh, free trade agreements, but in other cases, unilaterally. Uh, by reducing our tariffs and our uh, any any uh, impediment uh, for trade, uh, and and we want to continue that. Uh, good news is that uh, we have a lot of political consensus built into the country in terms of uh, keeping the economy open. Uh, in the political discussion, you don't see uh, the the closing the economy or reducing the the openness of, of the economy being being a, a big political issue. There is a uh, uh, wide uh, consensus in terms of uh, keeping the economy open and the, the benefits of, of that. In terms of uh, uh, who to deal with and who to trade with, uh, we are also very open. We don't discriminate by, by in any, in any uh, uh, difference. We, we basically 
uh, are happy with any uh, company and any country that wants to do business uh, with us. Uh, our only uh, uh, requirement is that uh, companies and countries will conform with the, our regulation, local regulation. We build a set of regulations to take care of the environment, uh, to be a very inclusive society in the sense that uh, we value gender equality, we value uh, the fact that uh, this, uh, this is Chile is a diverse society, more and more, with uh, lots of immigrants coming into our, our country. <laughs> so any company, any country that comes to Chile uh, with a good business, uh, wanting to devote uh, time, capital, culture, and, and of course uh, uh, their, 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 their uh, effort to build something new in Chile and that will uh, uh, basically respect our regulations and the way we do business in our country will be very welcome wherever that company comes from, wherever that country uh, comes from. Great, thank you very much, Minister Valente. So going now to the private sector perspective, we have on the panel Aimi Sentmate Grimaldo, who is the CEO of Banistmo Bank here in Panama, one of the largest financial institutions in the country and plays a critical role in project finance and working with international and local partners on funding projects. So if you could talk a little bit, Aimee, about the opportunity that you see not only here in Panama, but pan-regionally around infrastructure, what types of projects from your interaction with the private sector, your funding, and, and where you see that growing. Perfect, yes, good morning, and thanks to the IBB for this invitation. We have heard a lot this morning about the trade opportunities in this between the UAE and, uh, and the Latin American region, which I still believe, even though it's not a question, it's, <coughs> it's an opportunity we need to keep working on. The infrastructure is another area where we have a huge potential. Indeed, there are several studies that reflect that the Latin American region has a gap in terms of investment in infrastructure. There is one recent study from the Growth Lab from Harvard that indeed mentions the lack of domestic and international financing as one of the main reasons for this gap to exist. Therefore, there is also potential for our financial systems to work together to close this gap. In terms of, of investment, the region has just invested 2.8% of this GDP versus the 5.2% requirement of the United States Nations. And the vast majority of the funds to actually give back to, be, to, be, to fund those projects has come from banks. Therefore, we have and we need to work together as regions in, in this respect, UAE and LATAM, to try to find a way to close this, to set up the bridges that are able to or enable the, the investment infrastructure to take place. Areas of potential, as you mentioned it, or you request. Energy, the renewable energy sector is one of the main areas for potential investment in the region. There's also the telecom, the ports, the airports. And in that, these last two, I would like to call the attention of the UAEs because indeed these are experts, they are experts in this, in this area. And investing in ports, airports will improve connectivity of our region and at the end also will generally increase the, the growth of, of of the trade between and the investment opportunities between Latin America and the United, the UAE. <coughs> in terms of the projects that we have financed, Panama and our president was, was here before and he made reference to the projects. We have a $19 billion investment project for this five years period that is almost to finish. And we are remaining almost, we are, there's still like $4 billion to be invested. We are one of the banks that have participa actively participated in projects, in infrastructure projects in Panama. We recently participated and uh, structured the, the first gas energy plant in Panama that belongs to AES. So we do believe infrastructure is indeed an area where, where the government needs to work together to set up the right regimes to incentivate the investment. But financial sector need also to lead that kind of conversations and and discussions just to be able to attract or set up the right mechanisms to have investors to be able to have the investment in the region that we need in order to, to have a sustainable growth going forward. Great, and what kind of synergies do you see specifically with, again, the UAE or other, as on the, in terms of financing and, and the structure of the financial sector in both regions? If I may excuse, but I'm gonna make reference to synergies mm. for Panama specifically. And, and I do believe we, the UAE and Panama indeed has a great opportunity to, to be able to establish the right synergies. And, I, and I'm referring to leveraging the position of two important countries in these regions, which is Panama and Dubai, and, and evaluating the establishment of, a, of Aboriginal hubs for the financial sector, really. 
Panama and Dubai will both enjoy a stable and sound financial system, but still very close in this respect. It, and we are both gateways, one to LATAM, the other one to the Middle East, Asia and Africa. And that will be a great opportunity, but in this occasion, I think that we need to make use of the innovation as the new component of this, this new way of dealing between regions. And what I'm referring to, I am referring to, to the new technologies indeed to favor these synergies in the financial sector, like blockchain, like artificial, inter, inter, artificial intelligence, like, like new platforms to encourage not only the big project finance, but also the access to the financial sector from the SMEs. Hmm. So I, I believe there is a lot to do with the, the synergy, synergies that these two countries have. We hope we both have uh, we are considered logistic conglomerates. We enjoy state-of-the-art connectivity. We have stable countries. We have sound financial systems. We have ma positive macroeconomic perspectives. And we have a cosmopolitan nature of our cities. So that should favor the link in between Panama and Dubai. And if we make it possible to then convert Panama and Dubai as the way gateways for each respective zone, that for sure will help foster the growth opportunities and the trade opportunities, not only the investment capital opportunities between the regions. Great, thank you, Aimee. So we're gonna go now to Gemma Sacristan, representing here the Inter-American Development Bank. She is the Chief Investment Officer of Bid Invest and a close partner of LAVCA. Um, uh, if you can talk a little bit, Gemma, I mean, here you are sponsoring this meeting. Obviously, the IDB plays a critical role in making connect creating connectivity between different regions. What role does the IDB play specifically in attracting capital from, from global markets to the region? Yes. So, yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real, a real pleasure to stay here today. Um, the IDB group is the oldest uh, multilateral bank in Latin America and the Caribbean this year. We are celebrating our 60th uh, anniversary. And we have two banks. Uh, the IDB works exclusively with the public sector and IDB invests uh, with the private sector and with the Spain-owned enterprises. We uh, also have a, a fund called BitLab that promotes uh, innovation uh, within the region. Um, uh, basically, as the largest multilateral bank, which uh, our main uh, objective is to contribute to the sustainable development of the region, we play what we think is a strategic uh, role uh, to link Latin America with the rest of the region. The necessities that we have just uh, to finance the, uh, the, GD, uh, the sustainable development goals gap is around 600 bi uh, 650 billion a year. So as you can imagine, uh, even though we finance every year around $50 billion uh, with our own capital, we have a clear mandate to mobilize additional resources from all around the world. Um, we have partners from different countries and we are really interested in finding new ways uh, to bring capital from uh, new regions where we haven't really done too much in the past as the Gulf uh, countries. We have done a great effort in the last years with ASEAN, especially with our country members that are uh, China, uh, Japan, and South Korea. But we are always uh, looking for uh, new opportunities. Last year, in the public sector, we approved 96 transactions for around, for around uh, $40 billion, and I did invest uh, $4 billion. Uh, but this is nothing, as I said, only in the private sector we um, mobilize uh, additional $2 billion in different sectors. Uh, I completely agree uh, what I must, uh, just said about the importance <coughs> of infrastructure, uh, especially if we link infrastructure to sustainable development, productivity, connectivity, uh, employee creation, and so on. So our main focus as of today is infrastructure. Uh, we do around 50% of what we do in the real sector, and within the real sector, infrastructure is really important. Um, we see that uh, um, we can really uh, not only create the linkages, but also find opportunities for different kind of investors and trying to uh, uh, structure the different transactions in a way that link uh, credit profile or risk profile with return, with country's profile, ratings, and so on. And we do it through financing, but also through technical cooperation to prepare transactions and one of the main roles uh, we play is working both in the public and in the private sector to have uh, projects uh, 
radio bankable, what, what, the, what the sector calls a bankable project. We work a lot uh, with the public sector in uh, TPP frameworks in really having the real uh, or, the, or the best uh, framework for the private sector to tap in. So we are a strategic partner because we work both in the public and in the private sector uh, advising uh, the, the governments to really understand which is what the private sector needs uh, to really finance uh, transactions. Also, uh, we have offices in 26 countries in the region. We have uh, 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 representatives that uh, work both with the public and the private uh, sector, and we have experts. So we don't want to be considered only as a bank, that we are a bank and we finance transactions, but we are a catalyzer. We are a knowledge partner, uh, so we advise both the public and the, and the private sector and, uh, in, uh, in technical uh, issues around some of the main sectors, education, health, uh, infrastructure, energy, telecom, connectivity, uh, access to finance, and so on. So basically, this is our role, not only our role at IDB Group, but also uh, other multilaterals that are working in the region. So basically, we are, I think, a, a good partner to uh, find opportunities and to give access to a lot of information and contacts in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, instead of doing a follow-up question, I'm just going to endorse what Gemma has said, because again, Gemma has been an incredibly, uh, IDB has been a very important partner for LAFCA. He published something called the LAFCA Scorecard, which is like a doing business reports for private capital investment in Latin America, and it ranks countries on a series of indicators like minority shareholder rights, taxation of private capital, role of local institutional investors, and it's been an incredibly important project that the IDB has been behind for for over a decade. And by the way, Chile ranks first in the scorecard for over 10 years. It hasn't been removed from that spot. Panama is reflected as well. Um, so let's jump to, um, to Shrag. Shrag Shag is um, the CEO of Dubai International Financial Center. And Shrag, you're here uh, looking for new relationships. We were having a little conversation before about what would be you know, an interesting new set of relationships for you here in Panama and in Latin America. What opportunities do you see? What types of partnerships are you looking for or new financial links between Latin America and Panama and Dubai or the UAE? Yeah. Uh, just a correction, I'm CEO of uh, One International Financial Center, which is a, a strategy consulting firm that supports financial firms. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here and listen to uh, lovely conversations all day. Dubai has, in the last 15 years, created a world-class financial center. It hosts now more than 500 financial firms from more than 70 countries. What these firms are now able to do is, by locating in this world-class financial center, is to tap the entire region, both for capital and investment opportunities. We've seen great representation from different parts of the world. In the early parts uh, of our uh, journey, it was more from the Western world. So we had a lot of firms from the US, North America, Europe come in. And over the last few years, we've seen increasingly more companies coming from Asia, Africa, into the region. And that is a reflection of how the world trade is moving, how the world investments are moving. Unfortunately, we've seen very little representation from Latin America uh, in, into uh, the financial center in Dubai. Uh, well, what, what that does is that it does not then allow firms to actually have access to investment opportunities in Latin America. As, as we've heard from various, uh, my, my fellow panelists, there are tremendous investment opportunities in, in Latin America, but there's nobody there to showcase these deals to investors, to sovereign wealth funds, to family offices, to businesses that want to invest in these markets. And it's a very simple thing. So if there are more financial firms from Latin America that could represent some of these deals and opportunities to investors, not only in Dubai, UAE, but the larger Middle East, Africa, and South Asia region, certainly we'd see more investments going into these markets. And that's also true for private equity investments. And so you, you mentioned 185 firms or 95 firms that you, uh, you represent. Probably half of them are based in the IFC in Dubai as well. And they're investing in, in, in that region. But what we'd like to see is more opportunities for investors to invest in Latin America as well. And that can be simply done by hiring more firms. And we've seen Examples of that, in the last 10 years, we've had uh, 
one Brazilian financial firm invest, uh, to have an office in, in Dubai, and that has resulted in a great uh, um, uh, growth in the, the financial investments that have gone into Brazil from the region. So it's, it's as simple as being there, building the relationships with, with the investors in the region, and then seeking out these opportunities for them. Well, you've had an extraordinary op opportunity to see the type of appetite, what type of sectors, what types of investments are most interesting to Middle East investors, or maybe even from some of those other regions, MENA, et cetera. You know, are there, we've mentioned renewable energy and technology, agribusiness, uh, anything you can say about any of those sectors or? So, so uh, agribusiness would certainly be very important. Uh, food security is very cr important to, to the region. So that, that is an obvious uh, 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 answer. But in addition to that, as, as uh, you know, Amy also mentioned, uh, the UAE in particular has tremendous uh, expertise in investing in infrastructure, in tourism, in, in air transportation, in airport, in, in, in ports. So those would be the, the obvious investment opportunities because the investors understand that very well. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know if we're taking any, I think we're not taking questions from the audience here, although if anyone has a question and wants to raise their hand, be happy to go out, okay. And perhaps I'm gonna come back to you, Minister Valente, for, for the final word, just to talk again about maybe what sectors you see as most dynamic in Chile today. Obviously, there are extraordinary natural resources, the infrastructure in the country is, is quite strong, but we've also seen technology and even small bits of, of agribusiness, et cetera. What are you highlighting when you talk to uh, a region like the Middle East or even Asia about opportunities in Chile? Yeah, well, it's always very difficult to, to know what the sectors of the future will be. Chile, of course, has been known, very well known for copper and for mining in the north. Uh, and also agriculture in the center of the country. We are this uh, very strange ge geography with a very thin, long country. Uh, and, um, but recently, for example, we have discovered that we have uh, great conditions uh, for energy that we didn't have uh, before. We were poor in the energy of the past, we we're rich in the energies of the future, uh, because we, we do have solar radiation uh, conditions in the north, in the desert, that are, are among the best uh, in the world. And so we're installing the, uh, there lots of uh, uh, solar capacity and that's uh, energy that is being used for multiple things, but uh, specifically for desalinization plants, for example, to bring uh, water from the ocean uh, uh, that, that will help uh, mining. So mining is having, it's gonna have a, a probably a new boom there in the north of Chile because of the availability of water that uh, at the end that availability is uh, made uh, uh, at, at a reasonable price because of the uh, price of energy. So again, it, it is difficult. Chile has a very uh, interesting agro business. We, are, we have been uh, transformed very recently in the uh, largest exporters of uh, uh, blueberries in the world. Uh, we were growing all sort of things and uh, we're supplying uh, the world. You know, we're, we're the second largest salmon producer uh, in the world too. And we're exporting, of course, most of that uh, production. So I, I, I wouldn't tell you that I have one my favorite uh, sector. I think that uh, Chile is open for business uh, in many sectors. It's an it's economy that is uh, where investors can go there and challenge any sector. We have new entrant uh, uh, companies in the country that uh, in two or three years can achieve 20, 25, 30% market share because this is really a very open economy where you can challenge the incumbents. It's also a great economy if you want to invest in the rest of Latin America. It's a very stable country uh, as a democracy. It's a safe place. It's a beautiful uh, uh, city, Santiago, to live in. Uh, so if you want to establish there to do business uh, from Chile to the rest of Latin America, that's also a very interesting uh, thing to do. So the uh, um, service sector now in Chile accounts for uh, the majority of, uh, of the GDP. So even though we're known for copper and uh, mining, mining is just 8-9% uh, of our GDP. Service sector is uh, most of the economy. So there are plenty of opportunities in many sectors for any investor that wants to do business in Chile and they, they will be very welcome uh, to do so. That's a great note to end on because of course Panama also is dominated by services. It's easy to think of Latin America as a region where people, investors come to seek natural resources, but in fact, 
financial services and services an enormous part of the Panamanian uh, economy as well. Well, thank you so much to all of the panelists, and I'm happy to tell you all that you are, are now uh, able to have lunch. I think we're going to hear about that. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you all so much. And again, thank you, Kate, so much for moderating that panel. Fascinating discussion there and some very, very interesting areas we can all take care of. Yes, you know it's lunchtime, but just very quickly before you go, um, head to the lobby floor and then take one floor up from there. So we're going to the Seascape Ballroom. So from the lobby, you're going up again and lunch will be served. We are, as you've noticed, running a little bit tight on time, so I want you back in 45 minutes. So if you can be back here before two o'clock, quarter to two. Uh, oh no, quarter to three. Aye, 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 so we really are. 2.45, I need you back. And then a qu little change in the afternoon. We will look at Colombia first, Mexico second, and we're gonna look at Brazil and Panama, and then we have some other wonderful sessions that we're going to be looking at, new leaders, new opportunities in Brazil, and the new globalizers for my panel. And we also have an interview with the president of Haiti. So we have a packed afternoon. I look forward to seeing you back here. So please, please be back here at 2.45. Carry on, have lunch. Thank you so much for your dear attention, and I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Well done. Sorry you were all so rushed. <laughs> yes, we were indeed, actually. Thank you very much. A bit too much. How are you? I'm fine. How are you great doing? Great to see you on Dallas. Absolutely. You've been doing a great job of all this. Thank you. I know what's going to be saying. I haven't seen you around so hard. You've been busy in the chicken rice. Yeah. You're here for the Gracias.